Hello, today we're going to talk about forest ownerships and who owns America's forests. Before we go into the presentation, let me give you a general outline of what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to talk about the historic overview of who owns the forest and its patterns across the United States, looking at those national ownership patterns and talking about uh, why they are the way they are. I'm going to talk about the different types of ownerships there is uh, in broad categories, and then we're going to look at southern ownership types and look at eventually southern family forest owners and what motivates them and drives them as far as ownership goes. Here in the United States, and you look at, uh, and you can break the United States down into basically two, uh, two regions, east and west. And as you can see, we uh, have owned forest land and looked at forest land cover since about 1630. Now, when we talk about the eastern U.S., we can break that into subregions of north and south, where the western U.S. in this discussion will be broken into subregions of the Rocky Mountains, Alaska, and Pacific Coast. As you can see, the majority of our forest cover uh, starting in the 1630s was really uh, in the eastern U.S. And that has a lot to do with um, evapotranspiration rates and their impact on vegetation across the U.S. Uh, southern and northern parts of the U.S. are much more uh, have a higher rainfall. Uh, evapotranspiration rates are such that the moisture level is, is uh, more conducive to supporting forest cover than uh, the prairie, such as what we would have seen in the parts of the, the west uh, and in the Midwest. So beginning in approximately 1630, uh, the United States uh, here had about 1 billion acres of forest land across the United States. So the United States it was under a lot of forest cover. Uh, back in 1630. And as we began to settle and move across uh, the United States, you know, for about the first 200 years, there wasn't much movement and settling uh, as far as European settlement goes. But as that did begin to pick up in the late 1700s uh, and moving into the 1800s and stuff, we started to see drop in forest cover. And really, a lot of that. Uh, was mostly in the southern and uh, northern U.S. and the eastern part of the United States. By the time we moved into, um, you know, began moving into the 1800s, uh, around approximately by 1850, a lot of our land, we lost, a, began to see a, a big drop in the amount of acres in forest land, uh, and forest cover in the eastern part of the U.S. And that was a pretty significant drop. You know, we lost almost 300 million acres of forest land just in this 50-year period. It was estimated that land was being cleared on average at a rate of about 13 square miles a day for that 50-year period. So that dropped us down from a billion acres of forest land. Uh, you take off 300 million acres, we're down then below or approximately 700 million acres of forest land by the beginning of uh, the early 1900s. Following the early 1900s, as we moved across and into 2000, that is land cover, forest cover across the United States has really been relatively stable. And now we're estimated to be at uh, approximately by 2010 where we got about 751 million acres of forest land uh, in the United States. So who owns all this forest? You know, it brings up a good question. Forest is very diverse across the United States and everything. And with that diverse forest cover, we also have a diverse ownership. So let's explore who owns 
America's forests. We can break up uh, ownership into two general categories, public ownership and private ownership. Uh, public ownership includes things like federal, state, and local governments, where private ownership includes uh, family forest owners, corporate owners, and what is often referred to as other private owners. As you can see here in the United States, we have, you know, relatively a third of the land is under public ownership. The remainder, uh, almost half of it, more than half of it, almost two-thirds of it is in private ownership. And this private ownership can be broken down, as I said, into family forest owners, corporate owners, and what is often referred to as other private. Now, family forest owners include uh, individuals, family trusts, estates, and family partnerships. Corporate ownerships, as it, you think the name indicates, it's owned by industry and other uh, groups such as uh, timber investment management organizations or real estate investment trusts. And then we have our other private, which includes conservation and natural resource organizations, uh, for example, the Nature Conservancy, or other unincorporated partnerships and associations such, for example, maybe a hunt club. Um, and then Native American tribal lands would also fall under other private. So if you look at forest ownership, it's important to realize, look at the dividing line across the United States. Most of the private land ownership is in the east. Most of the public land ownership is in the west. So what is really driving that, what, what shaped that, what made it happen such that our landowners, uh, private ownerships dominated the uh, eastern U.S. and where public ownerships dominated uh, the western U.S. So let's explore the different types of ownerships and see what's, uh, what's driven this pattern. So with federal ownership, the federal government owns about 28 percent of all forest land in the U.S., with the majority of this being, as I indicated, in the western part of the U.S. And, and about 30% of it is in the east and 70% of it's in the west. So what's the reason they own it? Really is related to how we settled the United States. Now you gotta remember when uh, we were, European settlement was taking place, uh, public domain lands were, be given, were given away as an incentive to move people across the United States. And as we were moving across the U.S. and clearing land for agriculture, and everything, and then we hit the Midwest area, which is a very dry area, ran into the prairie. People were starting to be concerned there wouldn't be any trees left, things like that. Then we start to think, as a federal government, to set up policies to protect the land. And so where was public domain land still intact that they could protect? The majority of that was in the western part of the U.S. And so that's where they start to set aside land. People like Gifford Pinchot and, and actually Teddy Roosevelt, uh, who was a significant player in the conservation movement. John Muir, uh, the National Park Service, who's celebrating its 100th anniversary this year. These were the type of people that were setting aside away land. Different reason, national parks were set aside for uh, different reasons, of course, than our uh, forest land, our federal forest land, which was set aside as timber reserves and also to protect the environment. So now what has been set up is as we uh, see when the federal government uh, makes policies that impact uh, the environment and our forest land, uh, landowners here in the east may not be impacted the same as our landowners in the West because of this large federal holdings and everything that we see in the western part of the U.S. Now the federal government isn't the only entity that owns public land. We see that here in the that uh, state governments own about seven percent of the public land in the in the U.S. and the majority of this is occurring here in the 
eastern U.S. with really a, a lot of it up here around the lake states. And a lot of that land is probably in place to protect not just from an economic standpoint, but also environmental and social benefits um, for those states. Local ownership, this is your, uh, such as county and municipal governments. There again, a large portion of that here, up here in the lake states and Midwest and up in the northeast part of the U.S. Uh, a lot of that land has also been set aside for environmental and social benefits of the local municipalities. So now we're going to talk about private ownership, and here we're going to look at family ownership. Remember, that's the first of the categories, and it's the largest of the uh, landowners group of the various private uh, land ownership categories. So most of our forest cover is in family ownership, about 43% of it here in the U.S. Um, and really the way this was shaped, as I said, is people immigrated across the United States. They were given land uh, as an incentive to move, to settle uh, different parts of the U.S. It was also given to soldiers as payment for their service different things like that that moved the population as they moved in from the East Coast to the West, settling the property, clearing it for agriculture and everything. Our corporate ownership owns 16% of the forest land. And if you look at that 16%, most of that here Forest land ownership is taking place here uh, by corporate ownership really in, in the southern U.S., which shouldn't be too surprising since they are the breadbasket of uh, forestry here in the United States. And the big thing with them is they're probably the one large, the largest landowner group um, that has seen any significant changes within this category of shift in own, who owns that land. And we'll, we'll talk about that here in a second. Now let's look at other private ownerships. About 4% of uh, U.S. forests fall into this category. Um, and it's really, as I said, it's owned by your tribal lands, as you can see down here in the southwest up in the Great Plains, places like Kentucky, uh, large land holdings uh, owned by Native Americans. You also have uh, groups such as Nature Conservancy, uh, recreational partnership hunt clubs and places like that that own uh, forest land. So, as we move from a national perspective, we're going to move into looking at forest ownership in our southern forest. Really, as I indicated, the south is very similar to the uh, overall national average of U.S. forest land ownership. Uh, our public ownerships can be broken down by the federal government owning approximately 9% of our southern forest. Our local uh, state governments own about 3% of our forest here in the south, and local governments own approximately 1%. So 13% of that forest land is owned, um, is publicly owned, leaving 87% under private ownership. And with that, uh, Approximately, that can be breaking down to two-thirds of it is family-owned land, and a third of it under other and private, as far as private ownership goes. So let's look at um, corporate ownerships here uh, in the South and what has occurred. Uh, just really over a short period of time, and which has really been probably the biggest significant change 
in an ownership group on who owns the forest land in recent history. Uh, if you look back to um, starting in about 1998, most of the forest land in the corporate ownership group fell in t under industry's control. Uh, they were had the largest land holdings in this category. Um, but starting uh, in the early 2000s, moving into 2008, industry began divesting itself of its forest land uh, because they were less worried about timber supply resources and having to adjust to a new economy. So as uh, we move through time, uh, during that time period, you can see that the majority of that forest land that industry divested itself of was being bought up by our TMOs and REITs, that's our Timber Investment Management Organization, and Real Estate Investment Trust. Uh, and this has a huge impact on the way land will be managed most likely by these groups into the future. Uh, forced industry probably had a longer term impact uh, or longer looking out as far as management goes on their property. They were growing that timber to feed their mills in case there was ever a need for timber that they couldn't get from the marketplace. Where Timo and REITs are looking at uh, forced land ownership from an investment standpoint and less from a supply standpoint. So Timo and REITs are looking into the future with their timber lands and from an investment standpoint means that that land will much more likely be uh, much more liquid uh, into the future. So let's talk about the largest uh, ownership group here in the private group and that's the family forest owner. Uh, and if you look at it both in the number of acres and in number of ownerships, they're a very diverse group. And we're going to break that down here for you a little bit. So let's start with looking at the number of owners. You know, almost 60% of the forest landowners here in the south own one to nine acres of forest land. But if you look at it from the number of acres that are being held, and what are those um, forest size of those forest holdings, more than 60% of the land base uh, is in that larger ownership uh, holdings. So it's greater than 60% of our forest land is in these larger holdings. But the number of owners is greater than 60% is in that one to nine category. Has ramifications not just for forest management, but also from, uh, for example, from a cooperative extension standpoint as far as outreach goes, or our state agencies that are providing technical services. All of this um, type of information can help us in doing our jobs as we move forward, and that is uh, very important when it comes to forest management in the South. So family forest owners are a very diverse type of group of landowners. They own their land for many different reasons, and since really from a forest management standpoint, we only uh, can practice forestry down to about 10 acres in size um, is really the operational size of doing forest management. We're going to only focus on the family forest owners that own 10 or more acres of forest land. In the south, we can divide this family forest land ownership up into four basic groups. And this will help us to understand the differences in family forest landowners. These groups are working the lands, woodland retreat, supplemental income, and uninvolved. Uh, and these percentages, what we're seeing down here, represents the total acres held in the wooded acreages of 10 or more acres. So 32% of the working the land landowners 
32% of the acreage falls into work in the land category. 28% of the forests here in the south fall under in private land ownership for family forest owners, fall into woodland retreat owners. 19% of it is in supplemental income, and 14 of it is under the control of the uninvolved landowner. So let's talk about the work in the land landowner. They're a very pragmatic landowner who likes to work their land. They use their land both for financial and non-financial benefits. They enjoy being on the land and often have an emotional attachment to their woodlands. They feel confident in their ability to manage their land. And as you can see in this uh, categories here, that the majority of work in the land landowners, the majority of their acreage is in that 100 or more um, land class, and the majority of their landowners own 10 to 49 acres of forest land. Work in the land landowners are concerned about things like uh, the reason they own their land, not concerned, but the reason for owning their land is beauty, wildlife, and legacy. That's what's driving them in, in their ownership. And they're worried about keeping their land intact for the next generation, people trespassing or vandalizing their property, and property taxes are all important to them and their concerns as they own land and, and worry about owning that land. Your woodland retreat owner, they are, place a high importance on the lifestyle amenities in owning their lands. They are less interested in deriving income from their land through harvesting and selling timber. Many of them have strong emotional bonds with the land, deriving spiritual and emotional benefit in owning the land. Many see their land as a sanctuary for wildlife. The woodland retreat owner is the largest of the four categories as far as landowners are concerned and has the highest number of landowners who live on their land. And you really see that here in the percentage of landowners that own 10 to 49 acres. Almost 80% of them in this category uh, own 10 to 49 acres. So what's uh, the reason for owning their land? Uh, often they think of their land as a sanctuary for wildlife, as I indicated. So it's really things like beauty, nature, and wildlife is what is motivating them for owning their forest land. As you can see, timber production is extremely low on their list for reasons for owning forest land. They do also worry about keeping their land intact, people trespassing their property, and property taxes. Your supplemental income owner, really they're a landowner that has good attitudes about managing their land but are not often highly engaged in land uh, management. These landowners, though, are likely to have cut timber in the past and will cut timber in the future. Um, they're also, you know, are willing to conduct other management activities to improve their woodlands. They're not highly engaged. Um, they tend to own land up in the larger holdings but there is still quite a few that are owned only 10 to 49 acres. So what motivates them uh, for owning their land? Really it's leaving it as a legacy or receiving it as a legacy, investment into the future, and wildlife. They too are concerned about keeping their land intact, in, intact as well as property taxes, and uh, this group is uh, even more concerned about things like wildfire on their property. And this is probably because of the impact that wildfire could have on their investment in timber. The uninvolved. The uninvolved landowner has very little that motivates them about owning their land. Often they have inherited their land or it's part of an agricultural operation. They do not feel passionate about the land and often perceive lack of time as a barrier to managing that land. 
this group has an extremely large number of landowners that only own 10 to 49 acres. They tend to have less in the upper categories as far as holdings go. Um, but, you know, they are a landowner and, and they do do things on their property. Um, they are reasons for owning their land is legacy investment and they're also motivated a little bit by wildlife. They are concerned more about property taxes and trespassing and vandalism on their property than they are about keeping their land intact. Um, so this probably should give you a good idea. The fact that they're not too worried about keeping their land intact, and even though legacy is uh, one of the reasons they own their land, this group is probably more likely willing to sell the land if the price was right. So how engaged are they in in um, in their land management and working on their lands? Well, for for working the land, landowner, uh, most family farms, have, you know, they have limited engagement in the management of the land, but you know, working the land landowners the most engaged with 21% of them being classified as highly engaged landowners. So these are percentages that are related to how, how, you know, a category that's considered highly engaged. So actively taking participation in the management of the land, doing activities on their property and everything. And it shouldn't surprise you as you move this way, the category of highly engaged landowners should decrease where we only see 1% of the uninvolved are actually considered highly engaged landowners. So what does it mean um, as far as the activities they're doing on their land and, and how active they are? So in the past five years, uh, ma most of the landowners, if you look at working the land category, most of them have uh, done things to improve habitat on their property, uh, have cut timber on their property, and have management plan on their properties. And remember, this is a higher percentage of engaged landowners. The uninvolved landowners, most of them have, in the last five years have done none of the above. So that 1% that's uh, involved, only you know, a large portion have done nothing to be engaged in their property. The ones that are highly engaged in their property really have probably done things to establish management plans on their property, have cut timber, and have sought out ways to improve habitat and get cost sharing dollars. So look at look at future plans for their lands. So going forward when we're you know, if you're looking at into the future to the next five years uh, or more, um, really, as you can see, these landowners are willing to stay on their land. They want to stay on their land, since working the land landowners. But they're going to, you know, as you go across these categories, um, when you get over to the uninvolved, they're less likely to stay, uh, keep their land wooded in, into the future. And as you can see, just the opposite for selling their land for the right price. Work landowners that are highly engaged and, and really tied to their lands like the working land landowner is, they're going to be less likely to sell their land even for the right price compared to uh, the uninvolved landowner who's willing to uh, more likely sell their land for the right price. The smallest ones that are less likely to really sell their land for the right price is that woodland retreat owner. Remember what was motivating them uh, really to own land and everything? It was that sanctuary for wildlife. So they were, and they also own smaller acreage, but they're in it for, you know, they're probably second uh, homes type landowners, landowners that really look to their land for that sanctuary. So what about how do they want their advice? You know, moving forward, we think about uh, landowners and how they get information and everything is important to us 
as uh, owner, uh, as uh, agency professionals in cooperative extension working on it, as consultant foresters, or if we end up working for agencies or non-government organizations that, that work with landowners. It's important for us to understand how they want to receive information. For most landowners, even the uninvolved landowners, really what they want to do is they want written materials for the pro uh, is how they prefer to receive advice and information related to forest management. You know, well over 60% of the work in the lands landowner and woodland retreat landowners go to and seek out information and advice uh, through written materials. Um, still more than 50% for your supplemental income owners. And even for the uninvolved, it's well above 40% of them want written materials. That's the really the one piece of information um, that you can take away from this figure here is that no matter which of these groups and how involved they are and things like that, when it comes to seeking advice and information, they still like the written word. So who do they get their advice from? Where do they seek it out? Well, most of them seek it out from either uh, state or local governments, as you can see, from most of the categories, or a private consultant for many of them. So for us as uh, working for state agencies and everything, really we're probably uh, losing out on the uninvolved landowner, the one that maybe uh, could benefit from our assistance and become more engaged uh, because they they go elsewhere. They go to that private consultant. Uh, the supplemental income landowner, if you have influential people in your communities that are highly engaged in forest management and willing to do things, they may be the ones you want to focus on training because that's where the supplemental income landowner is going to go to for some of their advice is another landowner. Also to family and friends. So if the family members uh, has land and everything, they might be also a source. But really the important ones are most of them come to the state and local government for advice as well as private consultants. So um, now that we're coming to the end of today's presentation and everything, let me summarize uh, what we talked about in reference to, in general, the type of family forest landowners that, that we're dealing with. And we're just going to summarize from that perspective. Uh, the majority of our southern landowners own less than 100 acres. So if you look at the number that own forestry, most of them own less than 100 acres, right, as you can see here. If you look at the number of acres being held, though, or the size of the tract, the majority of forest land is being held in tracts 100 acres or more in size. So what's driving the reasons behind their owning of forest land? Really, the major ones are legacy, as you can see here, beauty, how the property looks and the joy they get from looking at it, and then wildlife are the probably main, three main reasons that forest landowners own their land, uh, private landowners here in the southern U.S. Very few of them own their land as far as, uh, I shouldn't say very few, but as you can see on this uh, graph here, investment, timber production, things that they might make uh, money from their land, rates lower than the uh, non-financial gains that they're getting from their property. If you look at the number of acres uh, and the reasons for ownership, legacy still up at the top, followed by wildlife, water, 
nature, so all these non-financial gains. You don't start to really until you get further down into it do you pick up uh, more on the financial aspects of owning their land. So let's talk about their concerns. What's their big concerns? And it doesn't matter if it's the number of owners or the number of acres, legacy is a big concern. And here it's holding on to that land um, and leaving it for that next generation. And that's why trespassing and taxes fall in it. People are worried about the ability to pay taxes. They don't want people trespassing on their property. Um, they want to keep their property in good shape and they want to be able to pass it on to the next generation. Landowner age. So how old are these landowners? You notice I haven't talked about that yet. Um, and we didn't talk about it as far as each of the individual categories goes. It's because really from a land ownership standpoint, the majority of our landowners are older people. Uh, and as you can see, the majority of land falls in right here, somewhere between the age of 55 and 74. And that really also uh, falls into pretty much also the number of owners. So uh, average, I think right now they say the average age of a landowner is in their um, around 65 years of age. So with that means that they're, you know, holding on to their land, they tend to hold on to their land, you know, I think the average uh, piece of uh, forest land is held on for about 22, 23 years. I might be wrong on that number, but it's, it's pretty close and everything. So if you acquire land, uh, usually, and for most people that if they're inheriting their land, they probably did in the when they were in their 50s and early 60s, they're going to hold on to it for maybe another 20 years before they then pass it down to the next generation. So what type of activities have they been doing on their property over the past five years? Uh, a lot of landowners do cut trees, often for their own use, um, as far as the number of individuals doing activities on their property. but when you look at the land area, the biggest one, wildlife habitat. So things to improve wildlife habitat is, is the big driver for many of these landowners when it comes to the type of activities they've done over the past five years. And what their future activities, there again, shouldn't surprise you. The big area is, is uh, related to wildlife, but it's also the as far as the number of landowners going to plan on doing something in the next five years also. Big drivers and motivators behind landowners and why they own their property is to do things to improve it for wildlife habitat. Types of management activities, these are different than uh, operational activities like doing things to improve wildlife habitat such as burning or or harvesting and things like that. For most landowners, the management activities that they're going to focus on uh, really is uh, things like advice. And from an area, they're going to continue to seek advice. But as you can see, for most people, they don't really have anything planned uh, from a management activity moving forward. And with that, I just want to wrap it up and thank you for uh, listening to today's lecture um, and hope you uh, enjoyed this talk. And I want you to think about this on why landowners own their land and everything and how it impacts forestry from a management standpoint, but also for, uh, think about how policies and those type of things impact landowners and how something that's done uh, to impact, for example, federal land because of concerns here in the east have a huge impact on the west and vice versa. And realize that forest land ownership for many of these landowners, they don't own land because uh, as far as private landowners go from a family forest standpoint, uh, 
They're not in it so much from a uh, timber production standpoint, and many of them own it for other reasons, but timber production is important for them in order to come up with the income that they often need uh, to implement things like wildlife practices. And with that, I'll bring it to an end. Thank you very much.